Welcome back, I'm Bill. Today I've got a Coleman 220BX with me. These were made in the Wichita factory between 1942 and 1944. Uh, at the bottom of this is stamped March of 1944. There's some debate about these, how to define a BX versus a B. Um, the B was made and up until 1942, this is an American 220B. And up until then, Coleman was making both a 220, which is this, the, the normal size vent, and then the 228, which was the, the large hat uh, with a wider bail and the underside is enameled in white. Uh, but the B, if you notice, everything's, this is a magnet, everything's brass. This doesn't stick to, well, it sticks to the jam nut there, but uh, tip cleaner's brass. If we were to go into the interior, all of this is brass. Um, the collar is steel, but, uh, and the, the burner frame is steel, but that's about it. Because of the war, brass and nickel were in short supply. So on the BX, steel fount, which is why it's painted, uh, the pump, that's, that's steel, um, the, even the tip cleaner lever is, is steel. Everything's steel in here. The only thing that's brass is the, the valve itself, which will save us later because everything on here is rusty. Uh, but the steel going into the brass won't rust together as badly as steel would rust as steel. So we should be able to get everything apart. Um, they didn't make a 228 version of the BX, presumably because of materials restrictions. Um, there is some debate over how to, how to identify a BX. At this point in time, they were not stamped on the collar. Uh, going by what the International Collectors Club Guide says, the BX is marked US on the bottom. Uh, from what I understand, these were not necessarily made to military specifications, but they had a contract to make lanterns for the US military. This was before the mil specs were produced. I think the first of those came out in 1943, and they really ramped up production in 44. So they were looking for other options, and the BX was one of those. So my understanding is, Coleman submitted a design to the military or to the government. It was approved and that's kind of what they had to go with. It sort of looks like they were on the verge of releasing the C version, um, but since the, the government had approved the prior uh, design, that's what Coleman had to go with. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is military surplus. Um, the 220BX was also made for essential civilian use. So for farmers and, and things like that, or folks like that. Um, so it, it may have been for civilian use or it may have been for the military. There really isn't any way of knowing. Um, as far as the B versus the BX, I'm going with what the International Coleman Collectors Club Guide says, and that's uh, various markings on here. Uh, the US stamp on the bottom, uh, the fact that everything is steel, I know there are some folks who argue that um, the BX is, you can only say you have a BX if you have the box marked BX uh, because they were still making Bs. And um, the problem is uh, sometimes there's bleed over with parts, there's bleed over with user manuals and, and, and literature and stuff like that. So it's entirely possible that BXs were shipped with instruction manuals for a B. Um, it's entirely possible that there's some bleed over with the valve design. If you look at the parts manual or parts, uh, uh, parts catalog uh, from a couple of years later, there's a part for the B valve, there's a part for the C valve, and there's a different part for the BX. Now, from the diagrams there, I can't see what the difference is between the B and the BX, but apparently there was. Um, but because Coleman didn't waste anything, it's entirely possible that you can have a BX with a B valve. Uh, or if parts were replaced later, it's entirely possible they could have put a C valve on your B or BX. So that's hard to say, but based on what the Coleman, the International Coleman Collector's Guide says, this is clearly a BX, so I'm gonna go with that. And if you wanna fight me on it, <laughs> that's up to you. Um, you can post something in the comments if you've got helpful information on that. So we're gonna tear into this. Um, I've had this sitting around for a couple of months since I acquired it. I have been putting uh, Seafoam Deep Creep on all of the parts that we need to get apart. Some of these may not come apart. Um, this is not the original globe. It probably, I think, would have come with a globe like this with the, <laughs> the logo that over time is, where is it here, is virtually impossible to see. Um, 
But uh, like I said, the good news is the valve body, both parts of it are brass. Uh, so we should be able to get even the rusty steel out of there. Um, this, is, this is steel. Um, and that's the part that's essential that we get apart. Um, other things like the, where the burner tubes go into the manifold, that's another story. Those may be completely rusted together. I'll see what I can do, uh, but that's not mission critical to get apart. Uh, the valve is. So let me get everything repositioned here. Let me get my tools out and we'll start tearing into this guy. All right, um, this is gonna have a lot of stuck parts. So here's your opportunity to see how we get everything apart. Uh, I have been putting seafoam deep creep on this since I got it home uh, almost two months ago. Um, and I'm still not sure how, how much that's going to do. Um, tip cleaner won't turn. Normally I take the generator off first, but we need to turn the tip cleaner up and that's not turning. So the first thing I will try here is sometimes just loosening the packing nut will free up the tip cleaner. So and that's really... <clears throat> That's really stuck. Ah, oh, there we go. Uh, you may notice in my videos, I use an adjustable crescent wrench quite a bit. It's just convenient. Um, I can constantly adjust it, but when things are this rusty and crusty, I am using the proper size wrenches. So, yeah, that's the tip cleaner still seized up. So, up. Um, applying some heat would probably free it up, uh, but it's entirely possible that the generator is just all seized up because this is steel as well. So what I'm going to do is take the, try to take the tip cleaner off here. These parts are brass, so they may be crusty, but they won't be rusted together. And I got that turned up now, so let me see. Probably won't damage the generator. There's 7 sixteenths on there, but I would like to get the generator off first. Okay, and that, that was easy. Got the tip cleaner up. There we go. And unhook the cleaning needle and drop that whole thing down. Oh, now the cleaning needle went through one of the holes, but there we go. So amazingly, that comes out and the needle's still there, so our generator's in good shape. Take the nut off. I will use my adjustable wrench here. Remove the tip, and to get the guts of this out, I guarantee is going to take some heating and quenching. Uh, and let's see. Oh, actually, we do have a brass generator, so that's that maybe what saved it. It's probably a later replacement. Some of these had steel generators. Uh, I'll have to heat and quench to get the the guts out of this. Uh, I won't show you that, but I've got a whole video on that on um, recovering or restoring generators. You can watch that video if you want. So now you can see that we can unscrew the tip cleaner. <laughs> it's really stuck in there because I'm turning it instead of the nut. We may need to put some heat on that to break it free. And it's falling down. So there's our tip cleaner. This nut, the packing nut, um, you can loosen it, but it won't do you any good. There's a packing in there. 
uh, and um, if that's bad and you need to replace the whole thing, um, you need to replace the whole thing. Uh, the, the actual tip cleaners don't really come out because there's a bend in the wire. Let's get rid of the eccentric block or at least get it out um, or not. Everything on here is really gummed up so it just doesn't want to come out. Now, this part is going to be more of a challenge. We need to get this screw out. This screw, um, sort of a set screw, holds the air tube and the burner into the, into the back of the upper part of the valve. So this is where you want to make sure you've got a screwdriver with a nice tip that fits in there and will bite. Again, I think this screw is steel. Oh, that's wonderful. So the deep creep is doing its work. I was afraid I might shear the head off that accidentally. Um, but we've got that screw out. So now the rest of this just unscrews and I can guarantee it's going to be a bear. So I could put this in the vise or put channel locks on it or a big large crescent wrench, which I'll probably end up doing. But first I'm going to hit this with the propane torch just to see if uh, that'll help. Uh, usually heat is your friend, lots of penetrating oil and heat should break that loose. Before you do this kind of work, with when you apply flame to it, make sure there's no gas in the tank. This is bone dry. I'm not too worried about it. that made it. Okay, relatively easy. It's still, still quite tight. Okay, we've got that out. Now we'll come back to this part later. Uh, I suspect these are these burner tubes are not going to come out and the burner caps probably aren't going to come off either. Um, and the air tube, uh, I expect, we'd have to get this screw out to get the air tube off. And I expect that, sh that screw is going to shear off long before it'll ever come out of there. But uh, we can give this a try, at least get the burner tubes off uh, maybe, and that can help us with the cleanup. So since this is hot, I'm going to set it down here on the concrete floor. Before we take the upper part of the valve off, the tip cleaner assembly, we need to, to at least loosen this nut. Um, we can probably take it off without that, but it'll be easier. Now this is a 9 sixteenths. Um, I've got a 9 sixteenths wrench here. And now with everything off, that'll that'll go on there but you may have trouble you may not have a 9 16 that'll get down there at the right angle some folks actually will make a bent one so if you've got the the wrench from this is from a 530 pocket stove um, if you've got a mil spec wrench those are actually designed for this and that'll go in there too To get the angle right. They're kind of a pain because of these supports. But if you loosen this nut first, that's just one less thing to, to hold this. The other thing, or the other reason to loosen this first is if you've got a nice nickel fount or you've got a nice painted fount, which I do not in this case, 
But let's say you do like this 220 over here, or let's say you're working on a 220E or a 220F, you don't want to mar the paint. So if you loosen that nut, that allows the burner frame to come up, it allows the collar or the frame rest to lift up, and you can slide something underneath there. This is just a piece of cardboard I've had for ages that's, that's cut for just that purpose, and that will protect your fount. Uh, you can take the lid from like a, a yogurt container, plastic lid, cut a notch in it and slide that under there, uh, and that works as well. So now the fun part is to get uh, the, the valve off. There are a number of ways you can do this. Uh, the first way that's tempting is just to put a wrench on here this way and, and turn it off. The problem is, if you do that, you're pushing on this side and you will almost certainly end up crushing the brass. And then your tip cleaner won't thread back in. So if that's the way you want to do it, and some people do it that way, what you need is an old tip cleaner assembly. Snip the lever off because, of course, the lever sits in this groove, so it will prevent it from, from turning. Um, cut the tip cleaner off, screw that in, and then put a wrench on it and you won't run the risk of damaging the threads there. The other thing, and I've usually found this to work well on Canadian models because the, the threads aren't, um, or, or the, the, the valves don't always seem to be as tight on Canadian as on American ones, but you can put a wrench on this back part and turn it off. But again, you're pushing here and you're pushing here. If it's really tight and you use a lot of force, you're gonna end up possibly crushing this ring in the back or crushing those threads and you won't be able to get the air tube back in. So the easiest way, or I shouldn't say the easiest way, but the, the, I think the best way to get these off without damaging anything is to take a crescent wrench, put it on there. This is a half inch. I think a 9 16 will work as well. If you've got a longer one that sticks up higher, that would make it even easier. But at this point, the burner frame can now rotate, so I'm not too worried about that. But you put a long screwdriver through there. And let's get a bigger screwdriver. This is where having a, um, a, a vise for your fountains would come in handy. But again, that seems to be more of an issue with American models, not with the Canadian. So I've never invested in a, in a vise for that or never made one. I'm going to turn this on its side. Get in a position where I can grip it. It looks like I might be getting the whole, the whole valve assembly. No, I'm not. Because the valve itself isn't turning. This is why you want to put something underneath that, that collar. Now, sometimes when you unscrew these on a 220, the lower part of the valve, instead of this separating from the lower part of the valve, the, the lower part of the valve, the actual supply, may end up coming loose from the fount and then this whole thing comes off as one. That's perfectly fine. Um, sometimes that actually makes it easier. And then you just separate the two later. So we've got this off. Um, that eccentric block, this so far does not seem to want to come out. Let me see if I can... Careful with these because they're brass and if it doesn't come out on its own. You don't want to snap that off. I mean, these are easy parts to obtain and replace, but that's not wanting to come out. So I'm just going to clean it as it is. It may come out once that once once it's clean. I'm going to leave that alone for now. Burner frame comes off. This is. On the outside, not too bad, but it's awfully rusty on the inside, so it'll be interesting to see what it'll take to get that clean. The collar. Oh, we need to take the knob off first. So it's just got a Phillips head screw here. Our 
valve wheel or our direction disc. And so the fact that this is splined on the 220B, it's square. This is round and splined to hold the valve wheel on. Um, that tells me this is probably not a 220B. Once that's off, we can just take off the, the collar. This is Rusty 2. Um, I'm going to put this in citric acid. We'll see what happens, how much of this. I think some of that's just dirt. Um, and we'll see how this cleans up. It may require some sanding in addition to polishing. Here's our cardboard. You can see all of this paint flaking off in here. Um, and this is, I think this may be the BX valve because the B valve has a little, uh, a little nut down here that can be removed. It's a drain. I'm not sure why they needed to put a drain on them, but they did. Um, so, uh, I'm guessing this is the 220BX valve. Uh, this is a 9 16 and at least that came off nice and easy. Let's see if that freed anything up. That's still really stuck. Let's pull the jam nut off and see what we've got. So I'm going to use some heat on that and see if that frees it up. Actually, there's a metal insert in here, so there we go. That did it. Heat is your friend. So there we go. Um, the packing appears to be in good shape. I'm guessing that that's what was stuck in there, probably. Um, maybe maybe this back or not. Set that aside. All right, so we're down to just the fuel supply, the bottom part of the valve or the valve proper. Um, these are usually really tight. Uh, this is a 9 16 And before I go to any big guns, I'm just going to put a 9 16 on here and, and see. Again, this would be a lantern vise would be helpful. And it doesn't want to turn. So, could put this in a vise upside down and try to turn the fount off. My experience is that these are usually very, uh, very tenacious and sometimes even that's difficult. So before I do that and before I go to an impact wrench, which has usually been my go-to on American 220s, <laughs> I am going to, I, I will get out an adjustable wrench here and I will put it on there. This will give me a little more leverage. Let's see if I can do this with facing you. Actually, I felt it break loose and now it's actually nice and easy to turn. So I don't think anybody's ever had this apart. It certainly doesn't look like it, but that was surprisingly easy. I was expecting a major hassle to get it out. So we've got the old style uh, fuel and air tube. These are really chunky. Um, so I think it's a three eighths. surprisingly, I won't say surprisingly clean, but surprisingly not totally slimed and gunked up with varnish and green goo. So we'll take our uh, air wire out and fish out the spring. 
the spring is in good shape. It could use with a little stretching. Um, it's interesting. There's there's actually some fuel still in there. So set that aside. It's a fuel and air tube. The the bottom here with the hex hex on it that definitely dates it as older. And that's our valve. So the last two things we need to do are get the fuel cap off and take the pump out. And that's no good. The <laughs> I was afraid of this. It's, at least the fuel cap's not stuck, but I think we're going to have to tighten it down a bit more in order to get the fuel cap apart. What you want to do is cinch it down so that the, the gasket is, is sticking to the opening and then you can unscrew the screw from the insert that holds the gasket. There we go. Notice I've got tape on these pliers so that they don't mar anything. our insert and yeah the, the gasket there's not much left of it so I'll burn that out with the torch and put a new one in and oh the deep creep worked on this I couldn't get it to budge a month ago but now it's free pull that out our pump leather looks like it's in good shape it's it's actually soft it just needs to be oiled um, notice all of this is steel so we'll have to clean that up um, going to be tight so I'll grab this with the taped pliers while we're doing everything else I will soak this pump cup in a little container of leather conditioner A, that's the backer washer and then there's this little cylinder that sits in the middle of the leather to keep it from crushing. I'm going to take all of this off so that I can get the spring. The spring is in nice shape. I'm probably not going to put that in citric acid because it'll just turn it black and kind of make a mess. Our cap comes off and the, the pump handle. So there we go. Oh, and last but not least, the air stem. Now, I am curious about the check valve. Um, some of the BX literature says that the check valve can be removed with a screwdriver. Um, as far as I can tell, this looks like a standard check valve, but we're going to see. And I want to make sure the check valve is clean and working, so I'm going to go ahead and remove that. And... Okay, this is a handy dandy check valve tool. If you don't have one of these, uh, you're best off not messing with the check valves. It's got a threaded bit here that threads into the valve. So we gently th thread that in by hand. And then this will slide down and the ears will go into the slot on the check valve. We'll turn it and it locks in. And then we'll screw it down. surprisingly easy if you've got the right tool. If you don't, you can damage the check valve. Um, a big screwdriver like this seems like it should just fit in there, and it will. But if you don't have it straight and you're applying torque and you twist it, or if it, if it jumps free, you end up tearing up the top of the check valve. And if you lose the, the slots, uh, the only way to get it out is with an easy out, and even that's not always easy. 
can hear it rattling and it seems to be good so I'm just going to clean that up and test it and we'll put it back in. Um, so yeah that's all taken apart. Now the guy that sold this to me wanted me to make a video out of it and wanted me to do a full restoration. In fact, I just talked to him this morning through Facebook and he was saying this would be a good example to show people what it's like when everything's rusted. Um, and you actually didn't see how hard it was because I made it easy with uh, two months worth of soaking in penetrating oil and then adding some heat. Uh, and we just got lucky with the, the valve and the bung. But uh, he kind of wanted to see what a full restoration would look like. So I'm going to strip the paint off of this. Uh, it's flaking off everywhere, uh, and it's been doing that ever since I got it home. It's got rust on here. Um, unfortunately, they don't make replacement water slide decals like this, but I do have a replacement, I think they're vinyl, uh, decal from Old Coleman Parts. Uh, and I will take the paint off with a wire wheel because I'm having trouble finding decent uh, paint stripper these days here. Um, so. We'll get to that. I will then, once it's stripped, I'm going to put that in my citric acid pot to make sure all the rust is gone. But before we do that, I am going to put all these other parts in the citric acid pot. Uh, and so I'll see you in the kitchen for that. And then we'll come back out and work on these other, other parts. We're in the kitchen now. If you've watched any of my videos, you've seen my lantern or stove soup before. This is citric acid. This removes the crud. It removes tarnish from the brass. Uh, most of all, it removes rust from steel. And so I've got um, a mixture, roughly one teaspoon of citric acid powder to one liter of water. I've got brass in the small pan and I've got steel in the large pot. I keep them separate so they don't uh, cross contaminate and pickle each other, discolor each other, because that just means you'll have more polishing to do in the end. Um, the steel is pretty rusty, so this will get us started. I'll probably have to go to a wire brush and wire wheel to finish the de-rusting, um, but we'll see how it, go how it goes from here. Next, I will go to the sink and everything's gonna get rubbed down with steel wool. Right, we've got our brass pieces here out of the citric acid and I'm going to just rub them down with some uh, 4 aught steel wool and that should get them cleaned up. Our eccentric block is still still stuck in there. <laughs> Definitely not coming out. Um, this is the main valve body. Probably need to get a new piece of steel wool here before I move on to the, the rusty steel parts. And this I want to run a, a brush through there. Generator. These are all carboned up inside typically. So, heating and quenching, which I've already done, and you can watch my video on generators to see how that's done. Um, we'll break it up, and then the citric acid does a pretty good job. And all I need to do now, you can use a bore brush for this as well, but these nylon brushes, I got them for a couple dollars on Amazon. Uh, work extremely well. One thing while you're doing this is you'll pick up on older generators, you'll pick up this brass screen, chances are, during the cleaning. Go ahead and throw that away. It's not necessary. Uh, it just causes problems. Um, those are from back in the day when fuel tended to have a lot of junk in it and things could get clogged more easily. But modern fuel is a lot cleaner. All right, now we've got our steel parts. Let's see how these came out.
These are a lot easier to clean when you can take them apart, but I heated and quenched this whole assembly up here um, half a dozen times, and I'm really not surprised, but uh, it, it doesn't want to come apart at all. So we'll do the best we can here. Again, this is 4 aught steel wool. And it's the, the finest you can conventionally buy, at least in a regular hardware store. And I'm checking both of the burner screens are in good shape, so that's good. Inside the burner tubes, but we can get at least the air tube clean. And because I can't get this apart and because it's steel, I'm going to put this in the oven. I'm going to dry it as best I can, blow through it, and then put it in the oven just to, um, to, to get it as dry as possible. Right, and here's our burner frame. <laughs> this thing is a mess. I think some Wire, a wire wheel is in this thing's future, but let's see what we get off with the, with the steel wool. It may not be necessary, but that's a lot better, and I'd be happy with that more or less the way it is. And the upright supports will clean up nicely. But all that was the easy part. <laughs> this is the fun part. And this is the part where I suspect we may need to take it up to the wheel. Unfortunately, I think that's what we're going to have to do because that's still good and rusty. So I'm going to put this in the oven just to, to make sure it's thoroughly dried and we'll continue from there. Okay, here we are at the buffing wheel. This is a, a six inch cotton wheel. The brand is Rock, same as this, and I'm using this white number five polishing compound. Everything, but just to give you an idea of what this does.
think I'm actually happy with this. It is bare steel, so trying to get it to a mirror shine isn't really realistic. You could do it, but it's going to take a lot of sanding, and, and it didn't come from the factory like that. My biggest concern is the pitting from the rust. I could do some sanding on that, but I think I'm going to leave it this way, especially since this lantern is going to be repainted. I think just a little bit of patina will complement everything else. So I'm going to leave this the way it is. Uh, the inside, I'm going to take a, a wire brush to that uh, before I put it back together just to get rid of, of this residue that's in here that didn't come off acidic acid. But other than that, I'm going to leave this the way it is. Uh, some of these other steel parts, like the pump cap, we can do with polish. Let's see what, what we can do here. 